What up, data nerds? Let's talk about my method that I use to learn new skills in my job as a data analyst. As judging by a recent poll, a lot of you are trying to learn how to learn. The process that I've built over the years for learning not only has a framework to help me prevent from procrastinating, but it also has proven tactics so that I can retain concepts long after I study them. I then maximize my time outside of the periods I'm actively studying to help reinforce what I'm trying to learn by using popular techniques that even Einstein himself would do. So where did this all start? When I was going through school, I was a mediocre student that couldn't retain anything past the class that I was taking. My primary method of studying consisted of staying up all night so I could cram everything I needed to know. Although this tactic allowed me to pass my test most of the time, if I needed to use this knowledge again in the future, I'd have to go back and relearn and start from scratch in order to understand this topic. In my day job, I sometimes go months or even years between using certain skills or working in certain knowledge domains. Because of this, my clients and also my coworkers can't wait around for me to relearn a skill or a tool that I need to know. So after years of frustration, I've become more invested in understanding how my mind works, specifically by testing different techniques. Even as of recently, I took a course on learning how to learn based on a suggestion from Bernard from my Top Jobs in Data Science video. It really open my eyes into why certain techniques are effective for me. So when I asked Coursera to sponsor a video so I could share what I learned from the course and also with the techniques that I use to learn, they were super supportive of this. So thank you Coursera for sponsoring this video. When it comes to learning, there are two major ways that your brain goes about thinking about certain topics. And that is focused thinking and diffuse thinking. Focused thinking is where you're concentrating intently on one thing, such as when you're writing code in Python for a data science project. So as you're concentrating intently on that task at hand, you're using the front part of your brain or the prefrontal cortex. With diffuse thinking, this involves a more relaxed state of mind and it involves you looking at the big picture. This happens more subconsciously and usually occurs during activities like walking or taking a shower and would be the method in which you come up with different charts and visualizations that you wanna use for your Python project. So focusing more on focus thinking. Focusing on focus. With this type of thinking, you're using your short-term memory, which research shows that you can only store about four chunks of information in your brain at a time. This is a really small number, so it's imperative that you remove distractions. When I'm working or studying, I'll put my phone into do not disturb or on silent mode so I can disconnect from the outside world. When I worked in an office with my colleagues, if I ever needed to concentrate, I'd typically go find an empty room to work in. Coworkers and classmates can be great for collaboration, but sometimes to get into that deep thinking, you need to remove those distractions. Distractions. Now, when it comes to preventing procrastination, it's important that you think about the process and not the product. So instead of focusing on a product, such as like a Python script that you have to give to your boss or a classmate, instead focus on the process itself that you're gonna use to accomplish this task. And there are a lot of great examples of effective processes. Tina uses her study with me live sessions to not only hold her accountable, but also the hundreds of others that join these sessions. For Tina specifically, she talks a lot in her videos about how her fear of not showing up for a live stream to study motivates her even more to accomplish this process and thus leads to her finishing her products. Another great example of this is how Kenji uses the 66 days of data science in order to stay on track and study every day for 66 days straight. And then in order to be held accountable, those that complete the challenge post their learnings to social media daily in order to be held accountable by their peers. So specifically in the cases of Ken and Tina, because they're doing this in a repeated manner over time, this is great at building your long-term memory. So I frequently get asked about the Google Data Analytics certificate. And the most common question I get is, how fast can I complete the certificate? And I personally feel that this is completely the wrong way to think about it. You can't rush storing information in your long-term memory. It takes time and repetition. And this is a tactic called spaced repetition. So space repetition involves learning something and then after a period of time, going back and reviewing it or even better, actively recalling this information. Our learning curve, or better yet labeled our forgetting curve, is very steep initially when learning something. However, when we go back and actively retrieve it or review it, this curve actually levels out. So as you put in those reps, you're more likely to retain that knowledge longer over time. It's similar to riding a bike. Initially, you probably had a lot of stumbles and fall when learning, but over time you built this up and you were able to learn how to do this. Now you could probably go months or even years between riding a bikes and pick it right up without having to start from scratch. So I applied a similar approach when learning Python. So now I can go months between using this tool and pick right up where I left off. So how did I actually implement this? At the time I was going to school and also working. And so my only free time to learn Python was in the evenings. So for this, I focused an hour to two a day at minimum to learn and study 
Python. Although this study plan laid the foundations for my learning, it wasn't the only tool that I used. In one study, researchers split students into multiple groups in order to study the effects of learning techniques. For this study, all groups were given the same material to study. For one group, they only allowed them to read it once, another group, they allowed them to read it four times, and then the final group, they were allowed to read it once, and then they were to actively recall it as much as possible. That last group significantly outperformed the other groups because of this active recall technique. Now I use this technique combined with my note-taking habits. For Python, I would go through and study a concept or a library, and then from there, I would exit out of the course I was taking and actively try to recall it through my notes. From there, I would go back from whatever I was learning from and compare my notes to that. If they didn't match up, I would just reiterate over the same process again. Now I record my notes digitally. I like this because I can go in and actually search them a lot easier. And if I need to look at some notes on a library that I need to access, I can get to it real quick. But one of the takeaways that I got from that learning to learn course is that written notes are actually better for knowledge retention. So I plan to implement more written notes. And if you have any recommendations for notes that you can take on your iPad, let me know. Have you ever noticed how colleges make you take related courses all at the same time? Or when you're taking an online course, there's multiple forms of learning, whether that's video exercises, written code examples, multiple choice, and so on. Mixing together different topics or different practice problems has helped with boosting learning, especially when the subjects relate. For our learning Python, I did this through reading articles and books outside of my normal learning plan. During the day, I would read articles from sites like medium.com that showed me how different people were using using Python in their daily lives. At night, I would read a book on Python that provided a different perspective on how to learn this language. By looking outside of that online course, it allowed me to look at Python in a more creative way, not only in how I learned it, but also how I implemented it in the different projects I would come up with. All right, so we understand this focused thinking. Now let's get into what I consider a more powerful method of diffused thinking. Albert Einstein is a great example of this. This dude spent the majority of his day in this mode of thinking. If you were to look at his activities alone during the day, you probably would have thought he was the least productive person you know. On top of the 10 hours of sleep he would take every night, he was known to take frequent short naps, regularly scheduled midday walks, and even musical breaks to play his violin. Interesting enough, his ideation of the theory of spatial relativity is attributed to his love for music and art and being able to combine these in a combinatory play manner. This diffuse mode of thinking that Einstein would frequently enter requires a relaxed state of mind that helps with not only ideation, but also with storing thoughts long term. So let's look at how you can improve these modes of thinking. And for this, we're gonna take some field trips. All right, so welcome to where I spend some of the greatest portions of my day, which is in the gym. And I feel like a lot of analogies can be drawn comparing learning to exercise. With learning, you can't just look over or review something once and have it mastered. It takes time and discipline. Now, I'm sure we all understand that exercising is good for the body. But personally, I use exercise primarily for improving my mental health. When I don't work out, I actually feel like I have less energy and motivation to go out and set to accomplish those goals that I'm trying to achieve. What it does inside your brain is that it releases protein and this improves your memory. And the hippocampus, which is the portion of the brain that deals with long-term memory storage, is incredibly responsive to these proteins. Research has shown that just 20 minutes of studying can help with improving memory and getting your motivation levels up to study. I'd argue that if you only had an hour of free time during the day to study and exercise, I would spend the first 20 minutes exercising and then the latter half of that actually studying. All right, and the last benefit of exercise, other than looking like a hot mess, is that it clears my mind. I escape and I'm able to think about things in a new light. Whenever I get back to working on problems or getting back to my studies, I'm now able to solve a lot of those complex problems that I didn't know how to solve them before. Have you ever noticed that some of your greatest thoughts come when you're brushing your teeth or doing something mundane like going for a walk? Well, this is quite simply because you're distracted. Distractions give our brain a break so that way our subconscious can work through these problems more creatively. Because of this, I like to add one or multiple activities to my day, such as like a five minute walk or maybe an hour long bike ride. Now I like to separate this from my daily goal of exercise as with an activity, I feel like I can still focus and subconsciously think about problems I'm trying to solve. Now in my day in the life video that I released last year, I got a lot of negative comments about how I integrated activity and exercise during my normal work day. So I'm not gonna lie, 
these comments were disheartening. I feel like we have this toxic work culture that where we think we have to be in front of a computer screen for eight to 10 hours straight in order for our workday to be considered productive. Personally, all these different activities have really fueled and helped me with coming up with different innovative ways to tackle my projects as a data analyst, and even with different video ideas that I've utilized for this channel. So it's very counterintuitive. The more activities that I've added into the day, the more I've become more productive with my tasks and my studies. Oh, it's getting dark, we gotta wrap this up. Now I do think there has to be a balance. You can't spend the whole day on a paddleboard and expect to learn Python. But after studying for an hour or so, maybe consider taking a break in order to go out, refresh your memory, and maybe you'll come back with some new and fresh ideas. All right, let's put this learning topic to bed. So I'm pretty sure that everybody understands the importance of sleep and that when you get lack of sleep, your brain isn't functioning as well. But let's be honest, we all can't be like Albert Einstein and get 10 hours of sleep every single night. But what I think is interesting about sleep and its impact on learning is that your brain at night when you're sleeping actually goes through and rehearses a lot of those tougher concepts that you're trying to learn. The more closely to a bedtime that you study a topic, the more likely that your brain is actually going to go through and rehearse it at night and even dream about it, which is also has benefits in learning a topic. So that's why in the case of learning Python, I didn't realize it at the time, but I was reading Python books before I was going to bed at night and it helped reinforce what I was learning because I was studying it so close to sleep. And even today, I like to read technical books before I go to bed. It's a great way of calming down, relaxing, and actually falling asleep pretty quickly. So a lot of these tactics that I've implemented and shared with you today, I was doing subconsciously before. But because of this learning how to learn course, it's really opened my eyes into being more intentional with certain tactics. With this, the course also taught me new techniques with prioritizing tasks and improving memory recall. So if you want to learn more, sign up with the link in the description for learning how to learn. The course costs $49 to get the certificate, or you can do like me and take it as part of the Coursera Plus offering. But as always with Coursera, they have multiple different options Options that you can take the course for free. And that's the thing that I love about Coursera is that they believe that education should be accessible to everyone. As always, if you got value out of this video, smash that like button. If you wanna see a project that I did with Python, check out this video. And with that, I'll see you in the next one.